about the need for a more creative approach to education, about the need to value individual talents differently, about the need to revolutionise how we think of mass education, and in that instance, the importance of, the, of drama and theatre uh, in the whole process. Um, people badly misunderstand theatre, I, I think. Uh, there's a great book years ago by Peter Brook. Does anybody even know, know Peter Brook? Peter Brook wrote a book called The Empty Space. And in it, he talked about the power of theatre. And he wanted to know, say, well, what is the essence of theatre? What is it? He thought a lot of theatre really wasn't worth watching. You know, it was a night out, but, you know, it passed the time. But as they say in, in, um, uh, in Beckett, uh, in Waiting for Godot, it would have passed anyway. So why would you go to theatre, you know, rather than just set, sat down with a, a bottle of claret? And he believed that theatre is on the most powerful experience that human beings can have properly conceived. But he said, but we need to talk about what theatre really is, if we're to, really, to focus on. He set up the Centre for Theatre Research in Paris. And, um, and he said, well, let's perform a thought experiment here. If we are to focus on theatre, what can we remove from the average performance and it still be theatre? What's the irreducible minimum? And I think it's a very good question to ask. So he said, well, you could take away the curtains. You don't need curtains for theatre. You could take away the lighting, as long as you can see what's going on, actually, even if you can't. An awful lot of theatre isn't actually visible. Um, vis radio. Uh, he said, you can take away the script. A lot of theatre's not scripted. Uh, you could certainly get rid of the costumes, as long as it's decent, and even if it isn't. Uh, you could get rid of the stage, and therefore the crew. Actually, you could get rid of the building. You don't need any of this. All these are additions to the experience of theatre. The only thing you can't get rid of, if you're interested in theatre, is an actor in a space and somebody watching. That's what makes it theatre. The actor is in a, you know, creates a drama, but the act of it being observed makes it theatre. The theatre is that relationship between the audience and the actor, even if it's just one other person. That's the irreducible minimum. And he said, that's what I am interested in, that relationship. And he said, I believe you shouldn't add anything to that relationship unless it improves it, unless it helps it in some way. And I believe the analogy with education is exact. That at the heart of education, the irreducible minimum of education is a learner. Of whatever age that person is, in whatever their situation happens to be, and a teacher. In some cases, the teacher is the learner, or it's, uh, it may increasingly be uh, mediated through technology. It may be a remote process, but the heart of it is that relationship. And I believe we should never add anything to it unless it improves it. And what's happened over time since mass systems of public education came into being, which is not that long ago, it's the mid 19th century, is that we've added every type of encumbrance to that relationship and obscured it. You know, we have testing regimes, national policies, we have party politics, we have building codes, we have um, architecture, we have trade union agreements, we have the interests of the publishers, the interests of the examinations board. All these things have encrusted themselves around the essential heart of education. And it's formed a kind of sclerosis around it, I think. Um, I mean, it's like to switch analogy. It's like an old painting that's been progressively obscured by layers of varnish and dust till we've lost sight of what the thing is. And what it is, is a process of helping people to engage with the world around them and to make more sense of themselves in the process. And when politicians, therefore, talk about getting back to basics, I wish they would. <laughs> I just wish they would. But unfortunately, um, some very smart politicians, and Michael Gove as well, <laughs> um, <laughs> believe that the basics in education are a group of subjects that they became used to at their own prep school. 
And typically, these subjects turn out to be ones which are associated with two ideas. One is a certain type of academic ability, and the other is utility for work. I will never forget the fact that when I was at school in Liverpool uh, in the 50s and 60s, the 1950s, that would be, <laughs> that I wanted to do art at the age of 14. I, was, I loved art. And uh, we had to make a choice. You know, the option system came up. And, and I said to my class teacher, I, I want to do art, but my uh, family, my, my dad particularly, he was a wonderful man, uh, and others, and the school, thought it was a good idea if I did German too. I'm still not sure why. <laughs> I don't know why, really. Um, I never got the hang of it, German. Does anybody here speak German? Well, congratulations, that's all I can say. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's fantastic that you can do this. I've been to Germany, and small children can do it in Germany. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the water, there's something in the water, I know what it is. But German to me, it's a beautiful language, but it's like Latin, which I liked. You know, all the case endings change, don't they? They have to agree, uh, the, the adjectives have to agree with the nouns. You know, the verb has to conjugate, the verbs have to decline. The, the verbs are always at the end of the sentence. You can't put it anywhere else or people get baffled. Um, and they're long sentences very often in German, aren't they? Because they have these long compound words. Um, so you could be speaking German to somebody and it can be five minutes before the verb shows up. You know, I mean... <laughs> Isn't it? You know, you could be talking to somebody, so you know for quite a long time who was involved in this event, where it happened and when, but you've no idea what they did, you know. <laughs> and I couldn't get the hang of it. Uh, it I, I accept it was my fault, but... Because but, um, people around me were getting the hang of it okay, it's just my mind didn't go in that direction, and... It was like Latin. Latin's the same. The difference is, if you're doing Latin, if you have to do a translation in Latin, uh, they'll give it to you on a Thursday, and you've got till next Tuesday. <laughs> you've got the weekend and a pencil. You know, whereas in contemporary German, people expect a response immediately. <laughs> you know, well, I couldn't get the hang of it. And uh, anyway, I, I asked them if... Uh, uh, I said I want to do art in German, and uh, I was sent to see the head teacher. And they said, well, you know, he said, Robinson, you have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, the problem is you cannot do art in German. Well, I was baffled. Because I'd been to Germany. <laughs> and there were pictures everywhere. <laughs> I thought, they can't all have been imported, surely, some of them. <laughs> some of the native speakers must have made some of them. You know, but no, 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 he said, you can't do it in this school. I said, why? He said, because they clash on the timetable. So this was presented as my problem. What it was was a failure of administrative imagination presented to me as an epistemological truth. You know, there's a conceptual conflict between art and German. And it wasn't a conceptual conflict. <laughs> it was Mr. Hughes who did the timetable. That was the problem. <laughs> he was my conceptual conflict. So I said, well, what should I do? And uh, the head teacher said, well, if I were you, I would do German. I said, why? He said, it would be more useful. Well, you're, you're familiar with this idea. Now, don't, I don't mean to say German is not useful. It is. Um, <coughs> especially when you meet German people. <laughs> it's extremely handy. There's no question about it. And it's, you know, it's the language of Goethe it's, you know, and, and of Hegel. It's you know, one of the most exquisite productions of the human mind. It's an extraordinary language. But is art not useful? Is art useless? Well, what became clear to me at that age is that the school curriculum was pretty much divided into two groups. Uh, subjects that were useful and subjects that were useless. And art and music were always in the useless category. Interesting, but useless. Whereas some subjects, languages, mathematics, and science, were thought to be useful. For what? Getting a job. And this always intrigued me, because um, people would say that, you know, you, you should do mathematics because it's useful. Not saying it's not. Um, but behind it was this idea of economic utility that you'll be in a better position to get a job if you do these subjects. And you know that, was that not true of you? That you were steered at school benignly away from things you might have been drawn to on the grounds that they're not useful. Don't do art, you won't be an artist. Don't do music, you won't be a musician. Despite the self-evident fact that millions of people are and make a perfectly good life doing it and one that fulfills them. 
So economic utility is one pillar, but interestingly, see, people do not say, uh, don't do math, you won't be a mathematician. Because also embedded in the education system is an ideology about academic value, that some disciplines or subjects, as they're mistakenly called, um, are thought to be more useful than other ones. And the, I thought we'd got past it, truthfully. I mean, when I was writing my PhD thesis in the 70s and 80s, um, I was working in a long tradition of people uh, who have campaigned, argued for, a different conception of education, one that's based on, I believe, a more dynamic conception of knowledge and a more coherent conception of human life and how people connect, a holistic approach to education, which is all it is, really, um, a, a, an argument for balance. And often politicians default to this view that there are subjects in the world, and some of them are more important than other ones, and therefore we should teach those. Um, I, uh, was, I met with one of the ministers this morning at the Department for Education, and it was a very interesting conversation. Um, and I pointed, you know, I, I was concerned, I am concerned, that this English baccalaureate um, privileges this core group, so-called core group of subjects, English, mathematics, science, languages, and the humanities have crept in. And I asked uh, one of the ministers, where are the arts in, in this conception? And uh, because what's happening, you know, is the schools are beginning to cut arts programs again. And he said, well, we don't want that to happen at all. So I said, well, why don't you stop it? <laughs> By including the arts, if there's going to be an EVAC, put the arts in there too. Make a provision for it. He said, well, you know, but there is a 40% discretionary time in education beyond the EVAC. And, and people, we, we hope people will do that. But I thought, well, you don't hope they'll do maths, do you? <laughs> if you want them to do, if you want to encourage people to do the arts, make it, um, put it among the priorities. You know, give it equal weight with everything else. And there are a bit different and better ways of thinking about education than the one that, unfortunately, I believe, uh, we're going to have to work with for a while here in England. Scotland has a much better framework. It always has, by the way. It has. Scotland's always been ahead of England, honestly, uh, in its approach to education. Do you agree with, with education? But they have uh, a curriculum now, which is uh, called the Curriculum for Excellence, which gives equal weight to a number of areas. The arts, the sciences, the humanities, uh, languages, technology, uh, religious and moral education, I think so, um, uh, health and well-being. That seems to me to be a sound conception of the components of the curriculum. There is no cultural economic reason for excluding these other disciplines. And what they've also recognised, and I say this in fairness to the, the, uh, the government in, in London, uh, their white paper has recognised the importance of teaching. But, and that's consistent with my analogy with Peter Brook, that teaching is what makes the difference. But you have to also to give people a framework that facilitates balance. And this default mode to this group of subjects, so-called, uh, is really just a throwback, I believe, uh, based on a misconception of what the basics are. Um, now, in other words, instead of looking forward to the 21st century, which is the one we're in, it's really a, an echo of a 19th century view of education. And you align that with what ministers, unfortunately, keep saying, that we need to get back to a, back to a, a didactic, fact-based education and a didactic process of teaching and learning, um, people giving lessons from the front of the class. Uh, and then you start to see the gap, I think, in their sense of reality. And it might be assisted, I imagine, uh, if we had some ministers who'd worked in education. That probably would have helped. Um, <laughs> I, find, I do find that strange. You know, people don't become the health secretary because they've had their appendix out, do they? <laughs> you know, you've had some organs removed, you're perfectly qualified to pronounce on the future health service. You know, your qualification is you've been to school. All right. Um, the other thing I found shocking today, by the way, is this, um, uh, the, uh, the Secretary of State talked about how terrible it is that of the 80,000 children who were in the school system last year who were on on um, free school meals, you know, from low-income families, that only 40 of them got to Oxbridge. You see, we've got, we've got to stop this, haven't we? 
I mean, Ox Oxford and Cambridge are fantastic institutions. But firstly, not everybody wants to go to university. Not everybody needs to go to university. Uh, there are plenty of other great options for people to live lives which add up to something and have purpose. Some people want to go straight to work. People want to go to vocational programs, many of which are fantastic. Um, but this idea that the pinnacle that everybody in education should aspire to is not to go just to university, but to go to Oxford and Cambridge. Well, what signal does it send? You know, that those who don't go to Oxford and Cambridge are the also-rans of the education system. And that those who go to university have made a terrible life error. You know, that's the other what goes with this, that going to university is, the, is the, what we should all aspire to. Well, you know, unless the government's prepared to add another 80,000 places to Oxbridge each year, then, of course, some people aren't going to make it, even if they want to. But the signal it gives to people is that they have somehow fallen short of the required standard of education. And if we know anything about human life, it's, it's based on diversity and individuality. I, you know, if you've got two children, you'd never confuse them, would you? <laughs> would you? Which one are you? <laughs> Didn't I just talk to you a minute ago? No. Even identical twins are completely different in some key respects. And that's what we know about human life. It's diverse. And human cultures are, obey ecological principles of synergy. The big problem, I think, for education is that it's based on principles of conformity and increasingly of standardization. And the consequence is that many people pass through the whole of their education feeling disconnected from it because it doesn't speak to them. It depresses them spiritually. So when we talk about getting back to basics, I think we should. As I see it, these are the basics, not a group of subjects. The basics are these. There are three purposes, as I see it, to education. The first of them is personal. That education is inevitably and unavoidably and properly personal. You cannot treat people as homogeneous units going through education. That we, all of us have different capacities, different interests and different passions, and one of the great purposes of education is to connect people with their own sense of possibility. That, and the principle here is that human resources, I believe, are like natural resources. Uh, they're often buried deep beneath the surface. Lots of people I interviewed for the element didn't discover their real talents until the opportunity presented itself or somebody they knew pointed them in the direction they should be going in. That they came upon something with other people's help or by a matter of circumstance. Um, and of course we don't know what we're capable of until we have the opportunity to find out about it very often. One of the big concerns I have with a narrow curriculum is it cuts off opportunities for people whose real talents may lie in the areas that have been segregated out from the, the centre of the curriculum. And I think that's true for a lot of people, that they conclude they're not good at anything because they're not good at what's required of them. But they may well have deep talents that we haven't yet touched. And the priorities, I think, for personalised education are to help people get in touch with their real capabilities, to give them a genuine sense of creativity in the world they face, and thirdly, to give them a sense of confidence too many of our kids and adults leave formal education with no sense of confidence about what they are capable of achieving. And the answer to that is a personalised curriculum. To all the great teachers I know are people who can look in the eyes of young people and see what will work for them. It's like a great doctor is. You know, if, you, if you're being treated by a doctor, you want somebody who has a deep knowledge of all sorts of situations and possibilities, but is able to apply that knowledge in your case and to see how it relates to you in particular. You know, I'm, for example, not against standardised testing in itself. It, it, not in itself. I mean, if I have a medical exam, I want some standardised tests. I do. You know, I want to know what my cholesterol level is compared to everybody else's. I don't want my doctor to tell me on some scale he invented in the car. You know. Your cholesterol is what I call level orange. What? <laughs> what is that? You know, I want the numbers, but I want them applied in my case. So, so the, the numbers become a diagnostic tool rather than as too often they've become, which is the purpose of education. The second big, I think, core function of education is cultural. That in the end, we live in a community of people and not on our own. We share this rather crowded planet with many other people. And we need an, an education process that enables us to have a sense of our own cultural identity, 
which engages with the identities of other people and their values and systems and ways of being. And thirdly, promotes a sense of tolerance and mutuality. And this opens up a whole debate, I think, about the content of education and its core. But by the way, since I mentioned the arts, it's often in the arts that the values of cultures become most apparent and manifest. If you want to discover the truth about previous times or places or peoples, you need to engage with their music as much as with the, the dates of their great events, uh, with their chronologies. And the third purpose of education is economic. There is no doubt that education has powerful economic purposes and should have. But the fact of the matter is, I believe, and this is something I, I'm keen that we should all try and impress upon our policymakers, is that culturally and economically, we are living in a revolution. And I believe this is literally true, that we are living in the most tumultuous times in human history. Now, I don't say that lightly because human culture has always been pretty tumultuous. But I think there are factors now which exceed any previous time in history. And there are two. And one of them is the focus of Learning Without Frontiers in, in a lot of work it does, which is technology. The new technologies are transforming everything. So that's um, one factor. That but the other factor is population growth. The Earth is now more populated than any point in history. Seven billion people. For most of history, there are fewer than a billion people on the Earth. And this population boom has happened in the past 50 years. There was a fantastic program, which I recommend you watch, that was on uh, the BBC, presented by David Attenborough last year, called How Many People Can Live on Earth? Good question, isn't it? Because we all need water, fuel, food, clothing, space. So how many of us can this tiny planet accommodate? Since water's running out, there's not that much of it anyway. Uh, the water tables in China are dropping precipitously at the moment. Uh, we're running out of fossil fuels. We've got good reason now to be worried about some of the nuclear alternatives. So what's the situation? And so they did a calculation of, uh, to answer that question. The whole program sets it out. You can download it on the internet. But what it came to, as time is short, is this. They said, if the average, if everybody, if everybody on Earth consumed you know, water, fuel, food at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 15 billion people. But if everybody on Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in North America, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.2 billion. And we're at 7 billion and counting. And frankly, the only reason we're getting away with it in the developed industrialized world is because the rest of the world is putting up with it or isn't aware of it. But they're becoming more and more aware and self-determining. And the emergent economies, by the way, are made up of a much younger population than the old economies. In the old economies, the population is aging. In the Middle East, where there's natural revolution happening, half the population is under, th under 30. So when I say there's a revolution, it's this combination of technology, culture, and resources. John, my brother, who's here tonight as well, and my other brother, Neil, have a great website. I recommend it. It's called The Peaceful Planet, which sets out you know, some of the, the dynamics that are going on in this area, and it's part of a bigger ecological movement. But it's no exaggeration to say that if we get this wrong, there would be very serious consequences uh, for, for all of us. You know, we are the most populous generation in the history of humanity, and we can't continue with the same practices that have brought us here indefinitely. In fact, probably not for much longer. So the challenge for education could hardly be greater. And the basics are not this group of subjects uh, that have been uh, venerated for so long. They are the core purpose of education, of the personal, the economic, and the cultural. And to bring that change about has implications for the curriculum. It has implications for teaching methods and styles. It has implications for the use of technology, which offer profound opportunities for the personalization of education, for the globalization of education. And it has huge implications for assessment as well. And all of this is possible and within our reach. But we can't reach it if our minds are locked into a 19th century conception of utility. We have to embrace the depth of the challenges that we face, but also the depth of the possibilities that our children face. This, to me, is why this issue of creativity is so critical. I just want to kind of bring, bring this to uh, this point, because we're going to have a break and then uh, have some conversation. There was a report published last year by IBM 
They did a survey of 3,000 corporate leaders around the world in every type of business and public sector um, organization in education. And they asked them what the, what the challenges are they mostly face. And they said there are three big challenges. The first is how to cope with complexity. The world is becoming more and more complicated for us. That I, I came across this quote on the internet, actually, for, uh, about what it means to be British these days. And it said this, being British these days means driving home in a German car, stopping to collect some Irish beer or Danish lager, picking up an Indian curry or a Greek kebab, and spending the evening sitting on Swedish furniture watching American programs on a Japanese TV. <laughs> and it said, and the most British thing of all, suspicion of anything foreign. <laughs> <laughs> we are more and more interconnected. We are joined in a common fate. Um, so the idea of complexity is at the heart of this equation and how we deal with that. And that means a form of education where people don't just think of subjects as being separate and disconnected, but see the essential continuities between ideas. There is much more in common between the arts and the sciences, for example, than we've been led to believe. There's huge science in the arts, great discipline in all, the, all of these areas, and much artistry in the sciences. I think we need a new renaissance here. We need to reconnect these ways of knowing which have become lost in the past two, three hundred years. So complexity is a big issue. The second thing they point to is resilience and adaptability. How do we change our ways and produce organizations which are adaptable and flexible to new circumstances? And we don't do that with a rigid, narrow curriculum. We do it by getting our children to live the lives they are leading and by promoting the powers of responsibility and adaptability and creativity, which is the last priority. How do we promote a genuine sense of creativity? Now, I've written a lot about that, and we can talk a bit about that after the break, but what creativity means in practice. But I believe it has to be put at the centre of our education systems. H.G. Wells once famously said that civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. And it is. Truthfully, education is how we prepare ourselves to meet the challenges of these short lives that we have. But to do that, we have to start with a deeper and I think more generous conception of our capabilities. The thing that sets us apart from the rest of life on Earth, I believe, is this power of imagination, which leads to the power of creativity. Creativity is, in a way, the child of imagination. And many of the challenges we face now are the results of human creativity. But we won't engage them by diminishing these powers, but only by increasing them. And I think as soon as we begin to grasp the true nature of human creativity, we'll begin to see the possibilities for a coexistence that will add up to something. You know, we can't predict the future, but we can anticipate it. And I think if we have a deeper belief in our own powers and the powers of our children and create education systems that celebrate and cultivate them, we'll produce a harvest of ideas and possibilities that will, I believe, eventually and sooner, I hope, rather than later, help to generate a future which our children will be proud of and that we'll all want to live in. Thank you.